Please take their seats. And of course, we welcome our distinguished Secretary of Treasurer, Hank uh, Paulson. Uh, first, uh, uh, we've had meetings where we all have agreed that you have made an outstanding uh, contribution to attempting to bring a sense of bipartisanship between at least the House and the, uh, and the administration, the President, that is. And uh, we assume that you've done the same uh, with the other body, but we'll wait until we see how their votes come on the stimulus package before we overextend our congratulations to your efforts. We're a little disappointed, at least the majority side, uh, that this budget has come to us without some type of an attempt to see what we could have worked out in the last year of this administration, as opposed to a budget that really politically doesn't make any sense. Most all of the uh, revenue saving pr provisions, especially as it relates to health provisions, have been rejected to by the Congress. Uh, the, the idea that we would have in this budget an extension of the President's uh, tax cuts of 2001 and 3, and the underfunding, at least the reporting of the underfunding, of the war provisions not being there as though the war is going to stop. The whole idea that for seven years uh, we have not discussed tax reform at all, even though in my projected tax bill, which is merely a, a talking point for the administration, we bent over backwards to bring corporate uh, relief because we know that uh, any loopholes closings we have without bipartisan support, they're going to be listed as, uh, as tax raises. And of course, what is most befuddling to me is how you handle the alternative minimum tax. You know, that's not the Congress's fault, that's our government's fault that 23, 24 million people will have this burden moved off every year temporarily at continued additional expenses of billions of dollars without just getting rid of the darn thing, especially after eight years, that you include the revenues in the future in the budget as though you never intend to get rid of it, and yet the rhetoric is that it's just unfair for it to be uh, here. And so, I don't mean to be offensive, but I kind of think that this budget is a political statement, and the Congress has got to work its will and try desperately hard to see how we raise money to pay for provisions that neither Republicans or Democrats are prepared to accept as relates to the cuts in programs that we think are essential to our constituents and therefore the country. I suspect that the die is cast and that there's very little wiggle room for us to move away from your so-called balanced budget. But uh, I like to believe that to the best we can uh, in this election year, that we continue to enjoy your cooperation and attempt to avoid confrontation where it does not help us as a Congress, it does not help this committee, and quite frankly, I don't think it helps our candidates, Republicans or Democrats for president, when uh, this is the president's last year, and, uh, and I know the dedication that you've given to the administration and what you've given up as a sacrifice, uh, that we do hope that uh, after we get past this that we can find some way to get back on track uh, with the outstanding working relationship that we have enjoyed with you. 
And I'd like to yield to Mr. McCrary, who, without his support, uh, I could not have enjoyed uh, this working relationship uh, with your office. Mr. McCrary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. It's nice to have you with us today. I look forward to your remarks. I particularly look forward to hearing your comments on the state of the economy and how Congress uh, can respond in the short term to the real challenges facing our economy. Tuesday's sharp drop in the Institute of Supply Management Index suggests real challenges in the months to come. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your work uh, with Speaker Pelosi and Leader Boehner on crafting a stimulus package that we hope Congress will act on quickly. I believe the incentives to business to increase their purchases through bonus appreciation will be a real shot in the arm for our weakening, weakening economy, and the other provisions, I believe, will also be uh, helpful. Our short-term economic challenges shouldn't completely obscure the need, though, to pursue pro-growth policies that will pay dividends for our economy in the future. I therefore applaud you and the President for your long-term fo focus on economic growth and job creation and your recognition that preventing a looming tax increase is critical to that effort. If we learned anything in 2007, it was that the majority's allegiance to PAYGO, as it's currently constructed, demonstrated in their budget proposals and in the Chairman's own tax reform proposal uh, and in the December debate over the AMT patch has unfortunately set the cruise control for a $3.6 trillion tax increase over the next decade. Unless we tap the brakes and shirk the yoke of this particular PAYGO, the issue for Congress next year won't be whether revenues as a share of D GDP will climb. The issue will be whether the revenues will come from higher marginal rates, a return of the marriage penalty, higher taxes on capital gains and dividends, smaller child tax credits, or whether the Congress will find some other taxes to raise instead. It is true that we could avoid those tax increases by passing spending cuts. And I would encourage my colleagues on this committee to begin thinking seriously about using our jurisdiction to start the ball rolling on meaningful entitlement reform, which will create savings. To that point, I applaud the President for highlighting the fact that our entitlement system is in desperate need of reform. Only an ostrich with the longest neck could continue to ignore the fact that Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, if left unchecked, will impose massive costs on future generations of Americans. Congress must make some difficult choices on entitlement programs, and this budget asks us to begin to meet those challenges. I hope the Congress takes the gravity of this situation to heart. Mr. Chairman, uh, I thank you for your continued uh, cooperation and working with me and the members of the minority on this committee to uh, develop uh, issues before our committee's jurisdiction, and uh, I'm hopeful that we will uh, have another fruitful year. Well, I'm certainly mm -hmm. secretary will be doing the best he can to see that we do the best that, that we can. We recognize that you have a time limitation, so I will ask the members to keep the record open for any opening statement that they would want to have included that would give you the maximum time after the secretary's statement to inquire. Mr. Secretary, welcome once again to our committee. Mr. Chairman, Congressman McCreary, members of the committee, I, I will also keep my remarks uh, quite brief. I'm uh, pleased to be here this morning to discuss the President's budget for fiscal year 2009. My highest priority is a strong U.S. economy that will benefit our workers, our families, and our businesses through a measured approach that balances our nation's needs with our nation's resources, the President's budget supports that priority. This is especially important now, as after years of unsustainable home price appreciation, the U.S. economy undergoes a significant and necessary housing correction. This correction, combined with high energy prices and capital market turmoil, caused economic growth to slow rather markedly at the end of 2007. The U.S. economy is diverse and resilient, and our long-term fundamentals are healthy. I believe that our economy will continue to grow, although at a lesser pace than we have seen in recent years. Yet the risks are clearly to the downside, and President Bush knows that economic security is of the utmost importance to the American people. In recent weeks, 
uh, the potential benefits of quick action to support our economy became clear, and the potential costs of doing nothing too great. So we are gratified that Congress is advancing a growth package to support our economy as we weather the housing correction. We believe that a growth package must be enacted quickly, it must be robust, temporary, and broad-based, and it must get money into our economy quickly. The House has passed legislation that meets these principles. If we keep moving along a fast track and Congress sends the President a bill that meets our shared principles, rebate payments can start in May and be completed this summer. Together, the payments to individuals and investment incentives for businesses will help create more than a half million jobs by the end of this year. In addition to an economic growth plan to help us weather this housing correction, the administration will continue to focus on aggressive action to tr try to provide alternative options to foreclosures. This includes encouraging the Hope Now Alliance's outreach to struggling homeowners. Congress can do its part by finalizing the FHA modernization and GSE regulatory reform bills and by passing legislation that will allow states to issue tax-exempt bonds for innovative refinancing programs. We continue to monitor capital markets closely and to advocate strong market discipline and robust risk management. Working through the current stress is our first concern. Through the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, we are also reviewing underlying policy issues because it is just as important get to get the long-term policy response right. While we are in a difficult transition period as markets reassess and reprice risk, I have great confidence in our markets. They have recovered from similar stressful periods in the past, and they will do so again. The administration will also continue to press for long-term economic policies that are in our nation's best interest, a pro-growth tax system, entitlement reform, and a balanced budget. To that end, the President's budget makes the 2001 and 2003 tax relief permanent and keeps the fed federal budget on track for a surplus in 2012. In the future, as in the past, our long-term economic growth will also be enhanced by supporting international trade, by opening world markets to U.S. goods and services, and by keeping our markets open. Congress can help create jobs and economic opportunities by passing the pending free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. I appreciate the cooperative and bipartisan spirit that has brought the Congress and the administration together to support our economy and look forward to that spirit continuing as we work through this period. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think the record should be made perfectly clear that, uh, as relates to Panama, the problem doesn't exist in this committee or in this House. I also have been under the impression that the administration is trying to improve the agreement with Korea, so uh, those issues are not in front of us legislatively or politically at this time, even though Columbia does represent a problem. Since you are not a politician, maybe you can tell politicians how we can explain uh, some of the uh, President's positions. I refer specifically to the extension of the President's 2001-2003 uh, tax uh, cuts. Uh, politically, we do recognize that uh, if they're not extended in whole or in part, uh, that they could legitimately be perceived as a tax increase. It should be made clear it wasn't the intention of the Congress to have them expire, but the President had them uh, to expire. And yet, uh, while we talk about uh, extending this, there's no talk about removing the alternative minimum tax. There's no talk about tax reform. It seems to me, as a business person, this is totally inconsistent, especially when originally the administration would put the expiration of these 2010 provisions into a stimulus bill, which economists say that it has to be timely, targeted, and uh, temporary. Having said that, 
It seems to me that when we talk about the stimulus program, that once again we're talking about helping business. Because no one talks about the compassion of the hundreds of millions of people that can't afford to put food on the table, or clothes on their kids' back, or get them an education or pay the rent. We're talking about finding hundreds of millions of American, most of whom work hard every darn day, some under the poverty line. But at the end of the day, we have designated them, Republican Democrats, as people that are in dire need. And if you give them some money, they're going to spend it. I don't know whether it's in the budget, Mr. Secretary, but it seems to me that there's something bad with that picture to believe that the only time we can find some equity in the tax system or equity in the support system is that when we need these poor people out there to spend money to buy goods and services and to spur the economy. I'm not asking for a, a do-good statement because it's too late for compassion. We have to get something out fast. But I do hope that you can point out some place in your budget where you're saying, and as soon as we get this economy back on its feet, and we will, that we'll never be put into position that we go into a recession, not because we're not productive and competitive, but because our American hardworking people can't afford to buy. I think that whether you're Republican or, or, or Democrat, that should be a painful experience that we're going through. And so if you can find any compassion along the line in response to anyone's question, it would help us a great deal to be able to say why this document is before us, which deals with tax cuts and raises taxes on the people trying to get health care uh, the most. And so I'm not here to embarrass you, but I do ask for your help in trying to explain to me and others the questions that I have raised. And I do hope there's flexibility to see what we can do before the year ends uh, to work some of these major differences out. And I yield to Mr. McCrary for questions. Well, Mr. Chairman, you raised a number of questions. Um, I, you lost me on the raising taxes on people trying to get health care. I didn't follow that one because the only thing if in the, you look at the only the thing Medicare in, provisions, uh, you'll see them. Well, but the president's if you're talking about health insurance, the president's budget proposes that we reallocate the tax expenditures from spending it on the wealthy, people like you and me, to people who don't have insurance through their place of employment, and we will give them a tax expenditure for going out in the marketplace and purchasing insurance, which they can't get today. So I think that's compassionate. I think it's forward-looking. I think it's a very vital part of meaningful health care reform in this country if you want to make the government's expenditures uh, more rational and more compassionate. So I would hope you would look at that part of the budget as well and well, commend the President for uh, bringing forward some progressive reform in the area of health care. If the General will yield, sure. it's my understanding, and the Secretary uh, could correct it, that employee-provided insurance uh, would not be uh, given the deduction in tax benefits. So. I thought that would kind of hurt the beneficiary if the incentives for employers to provide health care was taken away. Well, as I said, Mr. Chairman, those tax expenditures through health insurance provided in the workplace go to people who are relatively well off. Okay. The President's proposal more evenly distributes those tax expenditures throughout the income brackets and gives it to people who don't get insurance through their uh, place of employment. It gives them a chance to go out in the marketplace and get some health care or health insurance for their families. It's a very progressive uh, reform. Uh, I would prefer tax credits, frankly, but 
you, I would think, the majority, uh, and, and in their sense of compassion for people who need help, would be supporting a reallocation of those tax expenditures from the way they are today, which is very tipped toward upper income, uh, higher income people. I hope these people aren't eligible for a rebate, too, you know. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the House compromise, as you know, they are not. We are not eligible uh, with our incomes, and higher income people are not. So I think it was a good compromise uh, that, that your staff worked on and my staff worked on, and the Speaker's staff, and Leader Boehner's staff, and Secretary Paulson and his staff. Uh, so I, I think the House compromise is pretty good along those lines. Uh, you, you all got a lot of what you wanted, uh, and we got some of what we wanted, so that's what this is all about. I was very pleased with the bipartisan cooperation that led to, to that agreement and the very quick passage of the stimulus bill here in the House. We, of course, are waiting to see what the Senate does with that, but. I think our package uh, was very good and represented a high mark uh, in the cooperation between the majority and the minority in this House. Um, Mr. Chairman, I am having copies made of a chart, a graph, uh, and having it distributed because I think it's instructive on the issue of tax reform, tax revenues, PAYGO. Uh, so I hope the members will take a look at this graph as it rather uh, demonstrably uh, shows the uh, ills of the PAYGO system that's in place currently. Uh, I don't know if we can put it on the screen. Did we ever get capability to put it on the screen? No? No, we didn't. Okay. Well, if you just take a look at your graph, the, the top dotted line is the line that represents the percent of GDP uh, of revenues to the federal government under the PAYGO system. And as you can see, the line rather quickly gets up to right at 20 percent of GDP for revenues. And, Mr. Chairman, it doesn't matter how you get there, whether you let the 01 and 03 tax cuts expire, whether you continue to let the AMT kick in, whether you raise taxes on upper income people or whatever else, the fact is, under your PAYGO rules, you're going to get us to over 20 percent of GDP in revenues. That's a tax increase. No matter how you construct it, it's a tax increase compared to where we are today. The red line is basically what's in the President's budget. Now, it is true that in the President's budget, he doesn't describe what he would do to reform the tax code. And eventually, some President's going to have to work with the members of this committee, I think, to reform the tax code. But what the President does, I think, wisely in his budget, by saying, let's extend the 01 and 03 tax cuts, but count the revenues from the AMT in the out years, or at least past this year, you get the red line, which keeps revenues. They spike uh, in the first year up to 19 percent of GDP, but then it comes back down and levels off. And it, ev in every year for the next 10 years, it's above the historical average of revenues to the federal government. The, uh, the dotted line with the dash and dotted line represents the historical average, which is about 18.3 percent of GDP in revenues. So you can see in the President's budget, with his construct, he keeps revenues as a percent of GDP above the historical average. And then you can see uh, the green uh, line and, and block uh, graph uh, represents current law. So if we just extended current law, which is to say, Mr. Chairman, if we extended all the tax cuts that are in place from 01 and 03, if we extended all the expiring provisions, and if we uh, kept the patch on the AMT, you'd get that line. And yes, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that line may be too low in terms of producing revenues to the federal government. So does the President, evidently, because he keeps revenues above the historic average. So I just thought the, the members ought to see this very uh, clear uh, representation of the various views 
uh, on revenues to the federal government. Uh, and the PAYGO rules would produce, uh, Mr. Chairman, and frankly, your bill would produce uh, that dotted line that's way, way up above everything else and certainly way above the historic average. So just thought I'd lay that groundwork before we get into uh, listening to the Secretary. Thank you. Any uh, response uh, to our positions here? Okay, let me, you, you covered a lot of ground, and in the interest of time, I'll just uh, go over some of the points you made quickly. First of all, I, I know AMT is on everyone's mind here, and I just make the point that I, I think the budget is quite transparent. We would, we would, this year we would patch it, and uh, and I, I think we're all in agreement, at least I sure hope we are, that we don't need to raise taxes, we shouldn't raise taxes this year, and let's not subject, uh, you know, so many Americans to, to added uncertainty. Uh, let's not wait any longer than we, we need to, let's patch it. Now, in the out years, uh, you're right, those revenues are in the budget, and uh, what I think it needs to be done, and I, I think Congressman McCrory uh, re really got to the point. I think that is going to need to be addressed, and it's going to need to be addressed in the context of several questions. First of all, in, in the context of what we do with the major budget issues this country is facing over the intermediate and uh, term, which are entitlements. And it's going to need to be addressed in the context of what percentage of our economy do we want to be uh, uh, taken up by taxes. To when tax do we address this? The next administration? I mean, it's been eight years that we've been pushing it off and including it in the budget revenue. Well, uh, Charlie, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I I'm sorry. I appreciate your frustration. Uh, I had a little frustration myself, and I just have to recognize what's doable. I, I started off uh, really hoping we could get uh, people on both sides of the aisle to come to the table and on a bipartisan basis uh, with, with uh, no preconditions, really look at the question of our entitlements and, and, and look at all of these things. It didn't work out, and uh, but I'm so I'm just I, I understand the frustration. I feel the same. This is going to have to be worked out at some time, but again, I, I will j just say it's transparent. We have these revenues in the budget. We recognize that this has got to be addressed. Uh, we feel strongly it should be uh, patched this year. Now, just quickly on the other topics that you you all talked on. I, I reacted very much the same way that Congressman McCreary did to the proposal on the, uh, the standard deduction on health insurance. And here's the way I thought about it, that, that when, when I looked at the tax code and looked at tax preferences, the biggest tax preference I could find, which is $3.3 billion or whatever over a 10-year period, really was the preference that, uh, that employees of companies that provided health insurance received. And so this this privileged group got this big preference. It didn't go to all of the, the, the people that don't have health insurance, uh, work for companies without them, waitresses, construction workers, or whatever. And then even in the companies, uh, those at the high end, uh, their if the, if the companies had a gold-plated uh, uh, program, got the, the, the greatest amount of benefits. Now, when we put this idea out here, it wasn't that this was a be-all or the end-all, and this was a solution to all of the health care problems or the solution to getting more uh, people on, uh, to give more insurance to those who are uninsured, but it was a step in the right direction. And so I was hopeful that, uh, that uh, people on both sides of the aisle would say, this is something we can work with. This is a, a, a benefit that's really quite regressive and is unfair in many ways. And we could, we could, we could work with this, and it would make, could make a difference if we work together toward getting more people, insurance to more people who need it. Uh, it, it didn't work that way, but I, I just just make the point that in this year and in the years ahead, that when you 
grapple with this issue, there's a, there's a significant pot of money there that's being allocated in a way which I think is not optimal. I think it's being misallocated, and that's as we look at the revenues and, 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 and so on, this is, this is something to work with. Your last point on stimulus, let me just say something there, because I too think the agreement with the bipartisan agreement with the House was a very important step, and I think it does a lot for, for individuals, consumers, there's a big portion of that. And, and just remember where we've come from. The starting point, and, and I, I also need to say, making the tax cuts permanent, as important as that is to this president and our administration and all of us, was never part, ever at any time, part of any proposal on a stimulus package. From the day I first had conversations with the president, that was never, n never there. That was on a separate track. But the starting point was wh what you did in 2001 was to make payments, uh, the rebates, have those go to those who pay federal income taxes. This was quickly broadened, and uh, I think wisely so, but it was, it was broadened to apply to working families. And uh, with, uh, with the big uh, component of it going to, to, to children through the, the, the child credit. And n now the Senate has been talking about uh, extending it to, to, to low-income seniors and uh, disabled veterans. And, and, and our approach has been to say, I think we can work something out on that. So there is a, th this, all of it is, is, is stimulus. It's broad-based. And I, I think when you say, where is the compassion, uh, I, I will t tell you that the, uh, that, that working mother who's got $3,000 of earned income and has is, is, is got several children, and is, is, is going to be getting uh, $1,200 in, in, a, in a check. I, I, I think there's some, I, I think this is stimulus, and I think there's real compassion, and it's, I think it's something you all on, on this committee can be proud of. Now, on a, on a, a, whenever you're doing something on a bipartisan basis and where there's compromises, there's going to be people on each side that aren't entirely, uh, in entir aren't entirely happy. But again, I would – so, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, end on, uh, on that note. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. We very much enjoyed working with you. You're here today, though, as a uh, spokesman spokesperson for the administration, not as an individual. So let me just say a few things that relate to the budget and, and discuss a few issues. By the way, I think we should be careful in saying that those who have employer health coverage are privileged. They worked hard to get that coverage. And if there hadn't been an a deduction, an exemption, there wouldn't be health insurance today as extensive as it is. So I don't think they're privileged, and these policies aren't gold-plated in most cases. I'm glad I read your testimony that you don't use the words that were in the State of the Union, that the economic picture is uncertain. The term was, was used by the President, uncertain, because I think there are certain things that are very certain. Uh, there are problems that are real. Also, I won't ask you about some of the budget cuts because they're not really in your domain. Cutting out the manufacturing extension program, I don't know how that fits into economic growth. Eliminating the COPS grants, uh, cutting CDBG by over 30 percent, uh, cutting the water, uh, the state water revolving fund by 20 percent, LIHEAP by 20 percent, safe and drug free schools by two thirds. I think those are essentially dissembling and in some cases disgraceful. But let me just, you're not here really to discuss that. The deficit, I, I don't know of any economist who thinks that the President's budget is going to lead to a surplus in the year 2012. But let me ask you about uh, an item that's very much within your jurisdiction or mention. We've talked about China. I've read the latest report from the Treasury Department and it says that the appreciation on a trade-weighted basis, the yuan has been 5.68 percent. 
trade weighted, which I think is the accurate way to look at it. And so there is a long, long ways to go. And I think you should expect this committee to continue working on this and working on this this year. Let me spend a couple minutes because you said in your testimony that the, the rebates can be uh, start in May and be completed this summer. If unemployment comp is extended, the payments would go out in February or March. And you said before the Senate uh, Finance Committee, I think, that um, there hasn't been an extension when unemployment has been uh, lower than 5 percent. Mr. Secretary, the number of people who have exhausted their benefits is twice what it was in the first month of the last recession. And I read this, the exhaustion rate for regular unemployment benefits today is higher than it at the beginning of any of the last five recessions going back to 1973. So I don't know how you defend simply by saying the unemployment rate is only 5 percent when you have a basically historic level of, exhaust, of, of exhaustion of benefits. A million and a half or a million 400,000 people, it's projected that another million four or 500,000 will exhaust their benefits in these six months. So how is a spokesperson for the administration to offend your, your adamant resistance to extending unemployment compensation benefits when the exhaustion rate is at a, at a historic high, at least in the last decades, with the last five recessions? I mean, speak as a spokesperson for the administration. I don't want to ask you how you feel personally. A lot of us have come to know you, and I want to resist that, because you're not here in that capacity. But how do you defend it? How do you defend that? Can you go to any state where, 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 where a fifth or a quarter or a third of the people unemployed have exhausted their benefits and say, we're not going to extend your benefits? What, what would you say to them? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Congressman. Let me. Uh, I guess you wanted me to comment on two things. You wanted me to comment on China and currency and unemployment insurance. We can talk. Yes, if there's time, the red light. We'll talk more about the China currency. I wanted okay. to point that okay. out. Okay. Okay. On, on unemployment insurance, I, I take your point that that there's a structural issue and that there's a that there's more people that that have been unemployed unemployed for an extended period of time i understand that point but again it's very simple when you look at a situation not 5% but 4.9% unemployment we have a situation where unemployment in this country is low by any historical standard so that's and I looked, it wasn't just 5.7. 5.7% is the, it, with unemployment at 5.7%, that's the lowest it's ever been when we have extended the benefits. Okay, but well what do you say to, to these million and a half people now and a million and a half people who have exhausted their benefits? What, what do you say to them when, when you strongly oppose the extension of, you say to them, the national rate is 5 percent? What do you I, say to I, them? I understand there are different, there, there are different uh, levels of unemployment in different states. This is, th th we have a system in, in our country where there are uh, people who have various programs aimed at dealing with, 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 with their specific situation. I just think the signal we send to the whole world saying, what we're doing with with uh, unemployment of 4.9 percent extending it, I think that's a wrong signal. And to the what, world? And what we're to, to just it's it, it is it's rather unusual, isn't it, to have unemployment of 4.9 percent? I think what we're doing. The, w one way I look at it, Congressman, is I'm talking to a fair number of economists who are giving me a hard time and saying, how is it we're moving so quickly? with a stimulus package to throw money into the economy and support the economy at a time when it isn't at all clear that we're going into a recession. And you yourself, uh, Secretary, have said you think the economy is going to continue to grow. 
And so m my answer is we're, we're on this. We, we're going to have an aggressive stimulus plan that's going to give uh, give money to a lot of people that it'll help. And again, in terms of the stimulus, I think rather than a few dollars a week, what we're talking about is giving people big checks and giving it to them quickly. The unemployment check is my, my time's up. The unemployment check in most states would be considerably larger and in many states per month. So you can't say to the unemployed person who has exhausted their benefits, we're going to give you 300 bucks and that's it. Well, well, it'll be the unemployment person who's it, it'll be 300 bucks unless that person has got has got okay. kids. But I, I, I take your I, again. The, the only thing I, the other thing I will say to you is, when when this package was crafted, it was put together. It didn't have things that that people on both sides wanted, but it, it came together with something that worked and would be we, would be stimulus. And again, but we want an unemployment. And, and, and I'm saying, but, but I'm saying here that that if the situation continues to deteriorate, as I hope it won't, and I don't expect us to, to, to get much worse. But if it does, then this will be a matter that you will be discussing right here, and we'll be discussing it with you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Mr. Herger, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Secretary Polson, I want to thank you for appearing here today. I want to also thank you for your strong advocacy of free trade. Uh, as you know, we are the world's number one trading nation. Uh, some four out of ten American employees, Americans are affected, are involved in trade some 42 percent. And again, I, I thank you for, uh, for your work in, in, in this area. Uh, with our current economic uh, situation, uh, I'd like to ask you the, uh, uh, your opinion on some proposals that are before Congress. Last week, the Fed stated that our financial markets remain under considerable stress. Credit is tight and inflation has been rising. Would it be in the U.S. interest to further upset the apple cart by applying anti-dumping or countervailing duty laws to industrial, agricultural, or consumer goods from China to address any of our undervaluation of Chinese currency. We're all aware that the RMB needs to appreciate, but given our economic uncertainty, would piling on additional economic shocks by raising tariffs on imports through dumping and countervailing duty laws be helpful or harmful to our economic interests? Uh, uh, Congressman, I think it, 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 it's the simple answer is it'll be, it'll be, it'll be harmful, but it's, it, it's more than a simple answer because obviously we all, as uh, Congressman Levin has said, we all are focused on this. We all uh, realize that, that we'd like the Chinese to move quicker in appreciating their currency. We've been working hard to that end. They've recently begun to appreciate it much more quickly over the last year. The last three months, it's appreciated 4 percent. So there is movement there, an important movement. And again, I think, our, although our objective is the same, I think the idea of, of, uh, of putting tariffs on to deal with another country's uh, currency of sovereign nations, I think, is w would not be a wise thing to do given what's going on in the markets, and I just think it's uh, it's it, it's uh, it, it is uh, it's a dangerous course. You've raised concerns about the unintended consequences of legislation that proposes significant changes to our trade remedy laws, particularly to address currency concerns. As you pointed out, such bills could lead to WTO problems and retaliations by our trading partners against U.S. exports. I'm also concerned about copycat legislation that targets the recent weakness in the U.S. dollar. Given that, 
Our continued and strong export growth is crucially important to our economic growth. What kind of threat does retaliation and copycat legislation pose to our exports? Well, I would just say, uh, Congressman, today, of course, we're more uh, reliant on exports than, uh, than I can remember at any time in the recent past. It's very important to us to keep markets open. And so I, again, am a big proponent of trade. And again, when we look at how to deal with, uh, with, with, with trade differences, I'd say one, one, one route is negotiation, and we pursue that aggressively. Another is the dispute resolution procedures that the WTO has, and we, we, we pursue that uh, very aggressively. I, I am concerned that, that, that it's very hard, and I don't think, I think it'd be counterproductive for one nation to try to legislate another's macroeconomic policies or currency policies. We are making progress, though. I would just simply say that. And the IMF right now, I, I think the G7 has come together and, uh, and is uh, taking a strong position. The IMF is much more active. And so I think it, there, there, is, there will be more productive ways of moving ahead. But I, I do say we all, I think just about everybody shares a common objective. So what we're just talking about, what's, what's the right means? And I, I would agree with you that, uh, that legislation is a, is, is a dangerous and I think could be a counterproductive course. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. McDermott is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Paulson, it's, it's good to have you here. And as I sit out there looking at you, I, I couldn't help thinking of Colin Powell going up to the General Assembly trying to sell the justification for the Iraq War. Uh, this, this budget, I, I look at it and I try and figure out where is the war in all this? And I see very little. So I went to back and did a little historical research. And you look on the monitors, you'll see what revenue did during the Civil War. It went up to almost 14% uh, of gross domestic product. Then you look at the First World War, and the revenue went up to almost 24% of gross domestic product. And then in the Second World War, we went up almost to 45 percent of gross domestic product. So we were in wars, we taxed. But then if you look at the line for Iraq, all you see is it's going down. And I don't understand how you can come up here with a budget. I mean, I try to imagine if you were Goldman Sachs and a company came in with their budget and they left out a huge element of their operation, how you, would, how you could evaluate them when you leave out the war in the budget here? What, what is the reason? I mean, give us the explanation for the thinking that's going on in the White House that says we can leave the budget out of the war, just do that on the side, and not have the revenue. I, 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 explain that to me. Uh, look, I, I give you uh, a couple of explanations. First of all, those who say there's no transparency, I disagree with it because the the number you see in 2009, the 70 billion is a placeholder. That's all it is. Been very transparent and say that that number is 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 yet to be determined, and we're going to wait to hear what General Petraeus says, what what the other advisors are going to recommend. Everyone knows that number is going to be substantially uh, bigger. Uh, I, I read where uh, Secretary Gates gave a very, very uh, rough estimate uh, yesterday at, at, at a testimony. So I But the Republican at, candidate leading for president says we're going to be in Iraq for 100 years. Right. So you're telling me about one year there's a placeholder for 2009. Yeah. What about the long-term layout of that? Well, I think that is something we all have to expect that there will be a number there for a while, and and that is that's an uncertainty. But it is it is there's no there's no mystery. There's I mean there's no hiding the ball. It's just there's a number that hasn't been determined yet, 
And so, again, here's how I think about the budget question. Uh, because the, the one thing we can all take some comfort in is that despite the cost of, the, uh, of this war, and despite some of the other unforeseen costs like hurricanes and so on, the people on both sides of the aisle, all of us have been surprised and surprised on the upside with the rate at which revenues have been coming in. Even last year, where I thought maybe for the first time it won't beat our estimate, revenues have come in quicker. So the short-term deficit, the deficit we, we closed the year with, was as a percentage of GDP was a very small number. It was, it was 1.2 percent. And so the questions we're dealing with are really the, the longer-term questions, the, ent the entitlement questions, which are very serious questions. And I ap appreciate your frustration at not being able to pin down uh, the, the cost of the war. But you, you know what it is this I year. Just wanna, let me just, my time's escaping right. here. I want to say one other thing. What I don't understand about Republican fiscal policy is I arrived in Congress in 1988 at the end of the glory years of Reagan, and I sat through the mess on the banking committee of the savings and loan crisis. Now, 20 years later, we got the great Bush administration practically out the door with the housing crisis. And if, I, if you can believe these business magazines, this is Business Week, and it says there's a meltdown, worse to come, a 25 percent drop in housing prices. What is it about a Republican ability to manage the economy that they always leave a problem on the doorstep when they leave? What is that? Uh, I don't know if that's a rhetorical question, if you want an answer. I, 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 I'd I would, like an answer. I would, I would essentially say that what we see going on here, in my judgment, has been building for a long time, because what you've seen is, for years, we've seen how, how housing prices appreciate at levels that are unsustainable. So you're, get, you're getting a necessary correction. Now, I read very carefully. I got that magazine. I read it. R read the article. There are all kinds of projections in terms of what may or may not happen, but there's no doubt that th this housing correction is the biggest risk to our economy right now, and it's something we're very much focused on. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here to talk about the revenue proposals in the President's budget, and I just wanted to get back to that for a minute. Uh, as one who supported the stimulus bill, I want to commend you for working with us in the House in a bipartisan way. Uh, and this bill received the support of virtually everybody on this committee, nearly everyone. But I, I think it will quickly deliver relief to American families and job providers. And I just want to wish you good luck with the Senate on that. Um, as one who supported the stimulus, I, I worry, though, that if we only focus on the next quarter, and risk ignoring economic trends for the next decade, um, how we continue to get the U.S. economy to grow and to be competitive and create jobs, I think we need to examine the tax code's fundamental flaws. In 1960, America was home to 20 of the largest corporations in the world. Thirty years later, we were only ho home to eight of those companies. And I think uh, the reason being partly that virtually every industrialized nation has reduced tax rates leaving the United States with the second highest corporate rate in the world. Um, and I, I, I commend the, the President for calling on Congress to make permanent the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts. Those reduced rates provided marriage penalty relief, released, relieved us of the death tax, lowered taxes on savings and investment, and a rev revenue to the Treasury flowed and uh, the economy grew. Um, but in addition to those permanent uh, reductions, uh, I think we need to reduce the corporate tax rate, say, to the average of the OECD at 31 percent. Um, then the U.S. can really compete for jobs, and with that increased investment, uh, we, we'd, see, we'd see job growth. Since it's been 20 years since Congress really uh, looked at comprehensive uh, tax reform, really a comprehensive plan to lower taxes and streamline the code. and lower the tax burden. I, I wish I had seen the administration take a chance to really push for fundamental reform. Uh, but I have two questions for you. Uh, one, 
What are the administration's views for achieving long-term economic growth? And two, uh, using the power of the tax code to increase the number of people with health insurance is critically important, and I, I think uh, those ideas are, are essential, that not just for those that already have employer-provided insurance. So under the, under the President's plan, how many more Americans do you estimate would have insurance? Uh, uh, Congressman, w we estimated 8 million Americans would have insurance uh, un under the President's uh, uh, plan. And uh, I, I would also say, because, I, I, you know, uh, Congressman Levin said that all of those who have health insurance at the uh, working for corporations, they're not just a privilege, they've earned this. And I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I, I am all for employer uh, health insurance plans. I think they're good things and they're important. I'm just uh, j just saying I think that this is a, a, a big uh, pot of revenues we have to work with when we think about doing things more equitably and getting some of the things that, uh, that, that, that we would all like to achieve. And yes, you're right, this would, we think, add at least 8 million uh, uh, people who are uninsured to the insured roles. And, and then what do you think about economic growth in the long term? Uh, well, I appreciate I, I, the short-term work on the stimulus. You, the long term is what is important, and I'm going to just build off what, what you said, because we at Treasury have done and are doing a lot of work to document something which I think this committee has to increasingly be focused on, and that is uh, economic growth and corporate taxation. Because it is my view that the uh, of all the revenue we raise, and of course we raised, we need we need taxes. You need tax dollars. Everybody knows we need revenues. So the the questions really with taxes are what percentage, uh, how big should taxes be as a percentage of our overall economy, and then what form of taxes will give us the most growth, will give us the most jobs, and the. The corporate taxes, I believe, are among the most expensive revenues we raise in terms of what they do to jobs and growth and to inhibit that. And what we're finding is other countries are reducing their rates below ours. We're becoming a relatively high taxer. But even more important to me, their form of taxation is changing in ways in which it's, it, it is uh, more conducive to growth and ours is antiquated. And the trend is going in the way others are continuing to reduce their taxes. So how we think about this, I don't think it is, although I do believe that, that reducing the headline rate for corporates will make a difference, I don't believe it's as simple as just uh, reducing it by a few percentage points. I think someone, we need to take a really fundamental look at all of this. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Lewis of Georgia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for, for being here today, and uh, thank you for your service. Uh, you said in, in your testimony that working through the current stress on the economy is your top concern. Uh, I don't think it takes much for us to know and realize that the economy is tanking. It, it is not good. The American people are scared, they're worried, they're hurting, they're, they're losing their jobs, their health care, they cannot afford to send their young people to college. And I want to know, do you think that this budget, with the same old worn out ideas, is the best medicine right now? Is this the best prescription for our economy? Uh, will extending the 2001 and the 2003 tax cut help the thousands of our citizens in a city like Atlanta that are losing jobs? Just a few days ago, a company opened a store in Atlanta for 400 jobs, and more than 7,500 people showed up. Another major company headquarters in Atlanta laid off 500 individuals out of its headquarters. Um, where do we go? I, I do not see this sense of urgency. Uh, 
uh, co Congressman. And, and, and another thing, Mr. Secretary, you know, uh, the budget should be a, a reflection of, of our values. I, I just don't see it. I don't feel it here. I, I would like for you to sort of uh, okay. give me some sense so that I can feel a little bit better. Oh, okay. Well, well for, first of all, uh, Congressman, l let me say that you're right that the, e the economy is slowing. I, 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 are, we facing, I, I, are we in a recession right I, now? I, I don't believe we are, no, sir. I think we are slowing, and I think we're, and I would say the, the sense of urgency, I hoped you would have sensed a sense of urgency with the stimulus plan. But some people are saying that the stimulus package is good, right. but it's a little too, a little too little, too late. Well, again, uh, I appreciate your view on that. I would say there, there are plenty of people on the other side that says, boy, this is sort of unprecedented, getting here as soon as it slows down, uh, and we're, we're, there, we're still growing, and to, to move quickly with that. And then I would say, in, 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 terms, of the, uh, in, in, in terms of the budget, these are uh, complex, comprehensive, there, there are many trade-offs, uh, there are programs in the budget that are, you know, that I'm sure you, you, you like. There are others you'd like to be bigger. I, I would just say even on the tax, because there's been a lot of conversation about the, uh, the you know, the, the tax code, making the tax uh, uh, relief permanent. As I look at it, and again, I, I wasn't here to participate in that. I think those were, those were great actions. But as you look at this, as you look at lower income people, I, I see right down to a, a family of four making, uh, making up to $42,000 not paying federal income taxes. I look at what's happened with the child credit, earned income tax credit, and so in terms of relief at the low end, I see that as being very meaningful. Uh, uh, five or six million people who aren't paying federal income taxes right now as a result of what's been done, which I think is, a, is something that, uh, that we can all be pleased about and, and be proud of. Well, uh, Mr. Secretary, something went wrong. The previous administration created more than 23 million new jobs. Uh, people were doing very well. And now people are losing their jobs, people are not doing very well, people are owning and buying homes, especially minorities, Hispanics and African Americans and others. And something went wrong with this administration and with the previous budget and with this budget that you're proposing now. Again, I ask you, is this good medicine? Is this a good prescription for our economy? Well, I, I would tell you, I think, I think the, the best thing we can do for our economy is do everything we can to keep it growing. Because the, the, those people who are struggling and struggling to make ends meet, the, 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 their situation becomes worse if our economy isn't growing and we're not creating jobs. And we've created jobs for 52 straight, we, 52 straight months. And last month, for the first time, we had a slight decrease in jobs. Who knows whether that will be restated or not? The December numbers were restated up. So we're, we're increasing jobs. Uh, we need to keep the economy growing. And I, I think that is very important to the economy. And again, I'm hoping that the stimulus package will help. I'm working very hard on this uh, uh, to, to prevent avoidable uh, foreclosures and working very hard with our Hope Now Alliance to help all those homeowners who, many of them in inner cities who bought, bought were, were taken advantage of, put into mortgages that weren't explained properly and were those in, in, in danger of not being able to, to keep their mortgage if the rates move up. I think we have a program that's going to be uh, be more effective than many people do in dealing with that and fast tracking those uh, mortgages into modifications which will often result in interest rate freezes. So we're doing uh, what we can to deal with the, with the problems that, uh, that you see out there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Appreciate you being here, Secretary. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about a problem in the tax code that's come to my attention and see if it's something uh, you agree we ought to try to fix. Back in 1989, 
A section of the law was written to require cell phones to be used more than 50 percent for business purposes. If you remember, in 1989, cell phones had a battery the size of a car battery, and the phone itself was about as big as this <laughs> thing here. Uh, and airtime was expensive. Clearly, time and technology have marched on, and companies have given employees cell phones and Blackberries with unlimited minutes. And these communication devices are really just an extension of the business day and place to anywhere, anytime. Because airtime minutes are often unlimited and are free after certain hours and free sometimes during the day, employers generally have no interest in keeping track of employee cell phone or BlackBerry use. Yet, the IRS is at it again. They're after us. The dead gum auditors are questioning employers' normal and ordinary business deductions for cell phones and Blackberries because employers have not been keeping records on employee cell phone or BlackBerry use. The IRS wants employers to track employees or be forced to give up the normal deduction. Right now, the law does not require employers to track use of the phone at an employee's desk or the use of email or computers for personal purposes. And I think the law needs to be changed to bring it up to date with the fact that their office cell and BlackBerry is just an extension of their desk phone and computer. Secretary Paulson, don't you think it's time to modernize our tax law so that employers are not required for tax purposes to track personal cell phone use of their employees when there isn't any charge involved anyway, generally speaking? I'll be introducing a bill on this point on the next couple of days, and I would appreciate help from you guys on the committee if you want to join with me. Would you comment on that, please? Uh, I, I say very simply, Congressman Johnson, it sounds like the right idea to me, and I appreciate your leadership on that. Well, you know, we've been after the IRS for as long as I've been up here. They keep harassing people. That's their only job, it seems like, and we need to stop them if we can. I uh, would like to ask you also that uh, uh, we saw an increase in federal receipts, a uh, 6.9 increase uh, to a total of $2.5 trillion, and this is on top of fiscal year 2006 11 0.7 increase, and over that two-year span, spending grew by 5.2 percent per year. Uh, I'd like to know if we can uh, continue rapid spending increases, given the future demands represented by the aging of the baby boomers into Social Security and Medicare eligibility, and still uh, expect uh, our revenues to uh, cover our costs. I would say the answer to that is, as you know, of course not, and uh, that we've been uh, I think we've been surprised for some time at the rate at which revenues have been growing, uh, and that's a, that's a very good thing. But when you look at what we've got uh, staring us in the face, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge issue coming, and it's one that I know every member of this committee understands. and. Uh, I, I know the chairman and the ranking member would like to do something about it, and, and, and I hope that uh, at, 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 at some time in the not too distant future it will get worked out. Yeah, I can tell you for sure the chairman's interested in fixing Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Thank you so much. I'll yield back. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Richard Neal, and if he hears anything at all from the White House of how we can. Uh, reform the corporate tax uh, legislation, you let me know. Thank you. Mr. Neal. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I've listened to Secretary O'Neill and Secretary Snow and Secretary Paulson tell this committee and tell the American people what a serious problem alternative minimum tax is and how we have to deal with it. And we always get the same answer as the clock runs down. Let's borrow the money. How much have we borrowed now to patch AMT since 2001? Don't have the numbers here in front of me, but I know the cost this year is roughly $60 billion. And what was it last year? It, it, was, it was very much the same as 56 or whatever. Okay. Uh, what's the interest on that over a 10-year period? 29 billion sounds as though I, it might be I, I in the ballpark. I, I have 
you know, you'd have to tell me whether it's in the ballpark. I can, I can get the number for you. We rely upon you to give us that sort of an answer, Mr. But, Secretary. Well, the reason, the, the reason uh, I think we've been pretty clear with you in saying it's You've been right clear about the fact there's a problem. You haven't been clear about I, the fact I, that we I need been, to get an answer. Well, I've been, we've been clear about the answer. And the answer was patch it quickly, don't raise taxes. You ultimately did it. It took you throughout the year to do it, but it got done, and there was a lot of uncertainty that was inflicted on the American people. I think this year we should all get together and agree we, we're going to patch it quickly and, and then deal with the bigger issue. And I think the bigger issue, and, 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 and I really do think the bigger issue, and is one you would agree with, this needs to be looked at in the context of the bigger question and entitlements. If I might interpret what you've said, then you're suggesting that we all ought to get together early on and agree to borrow the money. Yeah, well, it's, it's in the budget, right. Well, I just want to get that part of it correct. We should get together and borrow the money to fix AMT. Well, I would say, I, I wouldn't say it exactly that way. You could well, what, was there another way to say it? The numbers are that, that I, I would say that the AMT is a, it, that if the AMT is an unintended tax, and the, it's, it's, it's unexpected, I guess, is what I would say. And there would be a lot of Americans that would have been hit hard and would have been surprised by that tax. So I think we've been pretty transparent. And Congress and the administration together have, have passed it one year at a time. Mr. Secretary, I have great personal regard for you. Right. There are only two options here. One, to pay for it or two, to borrow the money. Which one are you suggesting? I, I, don't, think it's, I, I don't think it's that simple to pick one area out of the budget. But there's, there's no doubt, though, that, that uh, we do not want to raise taxes to pay for it this year. And we want to be very clear on that. Well, I, you'll forgive me for suggesting that I don't think you were very clear on it. Well, now, let me, let me ask you another question. You don't think it's clearly in the budget that? I think it's clearly in the budget, but you're suggesting we borrow the money, Mr. Secretary. Well, we, we we borrow the money to pay for a whole range of things, and we have a whole and we have revenues coming in. All I need you to say is you're suggesting we borrow the money. I, I'm suggesting that we're going to have a deficit this coming year, and that the deficit will be larger than the cost of the AMT. Well, my sense is that when you were running a major company in this country in the boardroom, you were much more direct than you've been today. Now, let me ask you this, Ms. Secretary. As a percentage of the $410 billion projected deficit this year, could you inform the members of uh, this committee what percentage of those deficits are due to the Bush tax cuts? I think that would be a very difficult thing to do, and I'll tell you why. That Well, one-third, does that sound good? No, no, I'll tell you why I think it would be difficult, is I think because I think all of us have been surprised at the rate at which revenues have been coming in to the economy. And, the, and, and so I don't think static economic analysis paints the whole picture. I would n never argue to you that the, that the, the t tax cuts entirely paid for themselves, but I would say to you that, uh, that, that economists, I, I think, struggle to understand why there have been so many, uh, why the revenue growth has been so significant and why that, uh, that we have a, a deficit of 1.2 percent of GDP at the, end of, uh, at, at the end of this last year. Mr. Secretary, Mr. McCain's chief economic advisor, who was well regarded in this Congress for his clarity and for his integrity, has suggested that tax cuts don't pay for themselves. Are you in agreement with that? I, I would say that they don't pay for themselves entirely. That's, that's Thank you, correct. Mr. The Secretary. Mr. Secretary, former Chairman Greenspan said the only reason he supported the uh, tax cuts is because he assumed, and uh, that's what he said, that we would uh, cut programs by the same amount. Um, do you agree with, with that statement that he had in his recent book? I, I have no, uh, no idea what he was assuming and what he supported or didn't support. I, I would just simply say to you that, uh, that w when I was in the private sector, I watched the economy respond to those. I watched the economy respond. I watched the markets respond. And all I can say to you is that revenues have poured in faster than either party 
than faster than CBO projected, faster than Democrats or Republicans projected, and they've come in, and it is remarkable. It is remarkable that we could be paying for the cost of the war, funding the hurricanes, and have a GDP, excuse me, have a deficit of 1.2 percent of GDP at the end of. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Would you yield? Yes, yeah. yeah. The, are we paying for the cost of the war or are we borrowing the money for the cost of the war? I, I would say to you that the, the cost, the GDP is. Mr. Mr. Secretary, are we being, going to be asked again to borrow money before the year is out for the war in Iraq? We're going to be asked to borrow money, and Mr. I would say that's that, my point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but I would say that. But are, are, were you surprised? Are you surprised that the deficit is 1.2 percent of GDP? If you consider how the American economy has grown for the last 20 years, no, I'm not. What I'm arguing is that the theology that is frequently purported to be fact doesn't square with the numbers when we project a $410 billion deficit for next year. When the administration came to authority in 2001, we were projecting trillions of dollars of surplus. Granted, the events of 9-1-1 set us back, but not the failure to acknowledge the role that, that the tax cuts have played with those deficits doesn't stand up under the magnifying glass, Mr. Secretary. That's my point. And to say that, to say here that we're paying for the war when the truth is we're not paying for the war. We're borrowing the money to pay for the war. Well, I, I think you understood my point that d despite that cost, we, the, the deficit as a percentage of GDP is relatively low. Now, I think the thing that you're in agreement with and everyone on this committee is in agreement that the big issue we have and we have a serious uh, we, we have a serious budget issue staring us in the face, and I'm not making light of that. I think it's a very significant one, and I think it's one that's got to be dealt with, and that's entitlements. Mr. Chairman, Mr. McQuarrie. will you yield? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in response to Mr. Neal's question about how much the tax cuts uh, represent as a share of the deficit this year, I have a a fact that's very interesting. It doesn't necessarily answer your question completely, but it's relevant. Uh, back in the year 2000, in January of 2000, this is before George W. Bush was president, before the tax cuts, CBO and their uh, estimates said that in the year 2007, revenues would be $2.572 trillion. That was their projection before the tax cuts. The actual revenues for 2007, last year, came in at $2.568 trillion. That is a difference of $4 billion. So if you just look at the revenues that were projected and the revenues that actually came in, only $4 billion of last year's deficit was due to the tax cuts. It's a fact. I mean, those are would, facts. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, it's not my time, but I'm sure the chairman Mr. Would. Chairman would. It's Mr. Weller's time. May I claim my time? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Mr. English is recognized in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for coming forward. We appreciate the administration has put together a difficult budget. It's one where I disagree with some of the particulars, but I recognize that you've been attempting to deal with broad parameters, including dealing with a broader fiscal situation, tackling our deficit, and at the same time, providing the right fiscal mix to deal with our current economic circumstances. Now, uh, Mr. Secretary, you were instrumental in the development of a uh, stimulus bill, which has come through. The premise of that stimulus bill, which most of the House supported, was that right now we need a fiscal stimulus uh, to provide a tonic against a potential recession. Now, one of the main features of your budget, I think, is a natural follow-on of that stimulus policy, which is to say you have made an effort to extend uh, from the immediate future 
a massive tax increase that was accepted for the future uh, as part of the budget that passed the House last year. We have heard on the Joint Economic Committee testimony to the effect that this looming large tax increase has played a significant role uh, in uh, creating the environment where uh, clearly there is a falling off of growth and a legitimate concern uh, about uh, a recession. Uh, the looming uh, tax increase has contributed to the environment that may be creating a recession. Uh, you are a longtime observer of the economy and of Wall Street. Uh, can you comment on the importance uh, of making it a priority in the budget to push into the future tax increases that were incorporated uh, into the last budget uh, as a consistent policy to provide confidence that we're not going to do the wrong thing uh, and allow the last decade's tax rates uh, to be imposed on an economy that may be softening. Your comment, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, well, uh, Congressman, uh, clearly I believe that the, the, the certainty is 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 something that's 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 valuable, and it and, and certainty helps businesses plan, helps them make the decisions they need to make, and I clearly believe that the uh, when you look at the you know in, intermediate term, the longer term, the most important thing is our, our long-term tax policy, making that that relief permanent, but we were able to separate. You know th th that track, but that's on a different track from the stimulus, which is very much focused on this year. I understand that also, as part of your budget, the administration has made a concerted effort to identify programs uh, that no longer represent uh, the priorities uh, or the function that they were originally designed for. That the administration has done something unusual in Washington, and that is try to weed out some of the programs that may still have political constituencies, uh, but uh, uh, no longer uh, represent the spending priorities uh, that, the, that Congress originally embraced. Uh, would you care to comment on that uh, and the importance of prioritizing and cutting spending as part of our overall budget uh, strategy? Well, that's obviously, I, I think that's, uh, that's a very, very important point, that, the, um, that there's two sides of any budget. There's the revenue and there's the outlay. And, uh, and they're equ equally important, and it's, I, I think, very important to, uh, to, to focus on outlays and focus on, uh, on spending. And again, they're discretionary spending and non-discretionary. And one thing that hits any observer who looks at the budget for the first time is the, you know, the, the increasingly smaller portion of the budget, which is discretionary, and how much of it is mandatory, which again brings you to the need to deal with some of the entitlement outlays that are, that are baked into our fiscal picture. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm running out of time, but again, I want to thank you uh, for the effort uh, that you have made to bring a blueprint to the House that can form at least the basis of our kickoff of deliberations on what I think could be perhaps the most important budget in a decade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair would like to recognize uh, Mr. Becerra from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, good to have you with us. Uh, let, me, let me focus on these uh, on the tax side of things here a bit. And we all have to make our choices, our, delineate our priorities. I know the President in his budget calls for the permanent extension of his 2001 and 2003 tax cuts. My understanding is that if you were to calculate those in into a 10-year budget window, we're looking at about $2.2 trillion for the cost of those tax cuts. When you add in the debt service, in other words, the interest we'd have to pay because we'd have to borrow the money to do those tax cuts that go mostly to wealthy folks, it'd be about $2.6 trillion over the next 10 years. 
if we did nothing to the AMT. So in other words, if we allowed 20 some odd million Americans to get hit by the alternative minimum tax, those would be the costs of the Bush tax cuts to be extended. Now, I think most of us believe, and you just had a conversation with Congressman Neal about the President's proposal to provide a patch, a, a safe harbor for tens of millions of Americans from being hit by the alternative minimum tax. So that if we were to continue to do that over the next 10 years, the cost of the Bush tax cuts that go principally to wealthy folks would actually go beyond the 2.2 or $2.6 trillion over 10 years to actually over $3.5 trillion in cost to the Treasury to extend the Bush tax cuts that are principally geared towards wealthy folks uh, over the next 10 years. My question to you is, in, in the President's budget, which you're defending, it seems you've made a choice. You, you provide for a permanent extension of the President's tax cuts that are aimed principally towards wealthy folks. More than a third of those tax cuts, for example, will go to just the top 1 percent of American, uh, America's wealthy people. Uh, Whereas in the President's budget, the President over the next five or ten years doesn't call for a permanent fix to the alternative minimum tax that hits middle income families. It calls for just a one year patch. So a decision was made in the President's budget, I suspect, with his advisors all talking about priorities. And a priority, I, I guess, was made. It was more important to provide tax relief to the wealthiest Americans at the, to the, co at the cost of two and a half to three and a half trillion dollars, depending on how you calculate it, as opposed to providing tax relief to the tens of millions of Americans in the middle who will get hit by the alternative minimum tax. So that relief for them would be provided for only one year, but relief for our wealthiest citizens would be provided permanently. Um, did I misstate that? Uh, yes, sir, I think you did. And so let me. And as quickly as you can, because I want to go on to something else. Oh, okay. Well, I, I will th th then say uh, pretty clearly that I, I think the when you look at what, what the tax relief that we would like to make permanent is, that in look at the tax code right now, I don't think the tax code has ever been more progressive. Okay, Mr. Zegger, let me stop you. Uh, uh, tell me, let me just tell. Because I know we can have a, a philosophical disagreement, but let me ask this. Your, the, budget, the President's budget does call for the extension of the 2001-2003 Bush tax cuts. You, you, you bet it does. Okay. A and, and the President's budget only calls for a one-year patch to the alternative minimum tax. Yeah, and the, what the President's budget says is let's, let's fix Okay, but let me, this I, year, okay. rather than we get into philosophical okay. debate, let's just talk f facts. Okay. So the President's budget provides for a permanent extension of the Bush tax cuts. I won't categorize them as for the wealth. I just facts. Yeah, okay. The Bush tax cuts of 2001-2003 would be permanently extended. Right. The relief for middle class families uh, that are going to get hit by the alternative minimum tax would be provided, uh, ex extended for one year, the relief in the President's budget. It is for one okay. year in the relief and then we okay. freely So, so those facts are correct. Yes, now how you characterize them m could be differently uh, portrayed by the two of us. And so rather than get into that with you, we, we can let others then decide right. what that means in terms of extending the Bush tax cuts versus extending permanently relief under AMT. Let me go to another issue. Uh, do you, I know that this isn't within your sphere as a secretary on tr in Treasury, but do you believe that by the end of this year that the President will have removed all of our troops from Iraq? I, I'm not going to uh, speculate uh, okay. how many troops will be okay. in Iraq, but I think the President's been pretty clear, and I think uh, all knowledgeable observers are pretty clear that we're going to need a presence in Iraq for, for some time. Well, since my time has expired, I won't ask the question, but just make the final point. We're spending about $10 billion a month right now in Iraq, Afghanistan. The President clearly says he's not going to try to remove the troops anytime soon. Your budget calls, or the President's budget, provides $70 billion, that's seven months of spending, for Iraq total for all of fiscal 2009 and does nothing over the next five or ten years to account for any cost for Iraq, Afghanistan, or anything else. And so 
I, I was going to ask, but I'll just make the point. It, it seems to me that not only did you lowball the estimates, but you're playing hide and seek with the American public on this because to not account for the cost of a war, which the president doesn't seem to want to end, is to mask the out, out year costs to the, the American people of the president's proposal. So you can't, there's no way you balance your budget in 2012 if you don't even account for the cost of the, of the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, anywhere else we may go. And so, again, rather than try to characterize politically and otherwise, uh, I, I thank you for your time. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for yielding me the, the time. I thought you wanted to have a chance to respond. Oh, well, I, well, I guess I will be then very say what I said to the last time the war came up, which is, again, I don't think there's a lack of transparency. We, we know that the, the number next year is going to be greater than $70 billion. So why is it in the budget? And when that is because we don't know what the number is. But and you know it's going to be a it, it'll be greater. And so it's, it's pretty clear. That's, that, it, that is a challenge. And the, and the number will be greater than $70 billion and it will get filled in this spring. And Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Secretary, I've never seen a to. family have to budget the way the President is budgeting for America. It's my understanding, Mr. Secretary, that the views expressed by you are not necessarily your views, but those of the administration. I'd like to recognize Mr. Weller. We got to get back together in New York next year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Welcome, and it's good to have you before the committee again. And um, I have a couple questions I want to ask you, but before I ask my questions, I, I do want to make a comment, and, and I want to begin by commending you and the President and others in the administration for your leadership on moving forward the Colombian Free Trade Agreement, our agreement with, between the United States and Colombia. Um, you know, in Latin America, President Uribe is, is perceived to be uh, the United States' uh, most reliable and, and strongest partner. Uh, he's the most popular political figure in, in uh, Latin America. I think any president that has approval ratings of 60 to 70 percent continuously uh, demonstrates that the people appreciate the progress he's made on reducing violence and extending the presence of a democratically elected government to every municipality in the country. Uh, you've led con congressional delegations. You've done a tremendous amount of work, and I want to commend you for that. And, I also want to note that that agreement is uh, good for Illinois manufacturers, good for Illinois workers, good for Illinois farmers, and, and I believe that we should ratify that agreement. So I want to urge you to continue your efforts. Uh, you know, all of Latin America is watching how this Congress handles the Colombian uh, U.S. Uh, free trade agreement, and uh, I, for one, believe the consequences of failure to ratify this agreement will be a very long term consequence. Uh, because of the perception and role that President Uribe plays in relationship with the United States. So I want to urge you to continue that effort. My question here, Mr. Secretary, and my friend Mr. Levin um, talked about unemployment levels, and you noted that our economy today is, uh, is not in a recession, it's in a you know, the economic growth is slowing. Uh, you noted that unemployment uh, this past uh, uh, month was 4.9 percent, which is less than the average rate of unemployment during the Clinton administration, which I believe is like 5.2 percent. And you noted that Congress had never um, created an extended unemployment benefits program when the unemployment rate was as low. In fact, in 2002, it was 5.7 percent. My question for you, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, do you believe that the existing extended benefits program that we have in place, which is triggered according to the unemployment situation in each state, which has a trigger, which provides more benefits. Do you believe that that's adequate if there's a slowdown in certain parts of this country that would cause unemployment to rise in certain parts of the country? I, I believe it's, it, it's adequate today. And I think that, uh, as I've said earlier, if the, if, if the situation worsens to the point that we're not uh, projecting or expecting it to, it's something we should uh, discuss and take up at that time. Do you, um, but do you believe that the existing uh, program uh, uh, is adequate? Do you think that we should look at the existing extended benefits program and see what we can do to fine-tune the existing extended benefits program rather than creating a 
additional uh, extended benefit program on top of the one we already have? Yeah, I, I would say if, if there were to be some action, that would be the way to go at this time. Okay. I would, you know, as uh, with the role I play on the subcommittee of jurisdiction over unemployment insurance, I would welcome uh, the ideas from the administration that you, and I realize you're not Secretary of Labor, but right. you're uh, uh, compatriots within the administration, if they can share ideas of how we can fine-tune the existing program to make it work better when there's an economic slowdown. Uh, again, today's unemployment rate is 4.9 percent, and during the, the glorious years of the 1990s, it was on average 5.2 percent. Uh, so I would welcome those initiatives and hope that you would share them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lloyd Doggett of Texas. Is Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your testimony. Though uh, I disagree with many nice. aspects of the policy, I do believe that this budget is an excellent reflection of the administration's true priorities. Uh, when it comes to energy policy, uh, while the President did discover that America was addicted to oil, I think that this budget speech speaks much louder than any of his words. Uh, the budget uh, embraces every single tax subsidy, tax preference, tax benefit for fossil fuels currently in our tax code, but it totally rejects even a one-year extension of the tax credits for wind energy or for biodiesel or for solar energy. Uh, and of course, all of those would be in place and in law today had it not been for the fact that uh, with the determined opposition of the administration, you were able to hold us to 59 votes in the Senate, one vote short of the supermajority necessary to move America in the direction of a sound, new, renewable energy policy, uh, and rejected all the work of this committee in that area. Uh, I want to ask you first, in contrast, the position that you've taken on the initiative that Mr. McCrory applauded, that you and I had a a bit of a disagreement on last year when you testified, and that's your health insurance uh, tax proposal. If I understand that proposal, and, and I disagree with it on its merits, but one thing that I do applaud you on, as proposed in this budget just as last year, is that it is a revenue neutral uh, proposal. It does not add anything to the national debt, does it, if we adopted your proposal in full? Is that correct? I think it, that it sure is intended to, to, uh, right. to, to be revenue neutral. And the way you achieve that revenue neutrality, and this is what you and I got into debate on last year, and you finally uh, conceded the point, that in order to do what you think is a, a benefit, a positive step for 80 percent of the people that have these health insurance policies and maintain revenue neutrality, you, as you, as you said in your testimony, uh, 20 percent of the people, uh, about 30 or 38 million Americans, will have the opportunity to restructure their insurance, and these are your words, or they will pay more taxes. And so in order to get this health insurance program that Mr. McCrary and you applaud and the administration have endorsed now two years in a row, you raise taxes on 30 or 38 million people in order to maintain revenue neutrality. You tell them that their tax bill will be higher if they uh, – if they want, or they can restructure their policy. They cannot follow that conduct. And my question to you is, uh, is there any offset that the administration will accept for renewable energy so we can apply with our PAYGO rules and get our renewable energy tax incentives? I understand you don't want to do anything to the fossil fuel industry. Or is the only renewable energy tax incentive policy that you will support as an administration one that requires us to go out and borrow more money and incur more national debt. Uh, Congressman, uh, first of all, thank you for your comments. And there's no doubt that, uh, that energy security is as big an issue as we have in this country. It ranks right up there with the uh, entitlements issues we were talking about. So that's number one. Number two, I felt, and I think a lot of people did, that, that the energy bill that was done this last year it was, was a big step forward. So I, I you know. It, it, well, we just couldn't get your votes for it, though. Well, you know, we you had know, 59 I gotta tell you votes that, well, in the Senate. It would be law today. I, I think the president applauds the objectives. He just doesn't want to pay the cost of getting well, it. Well, I got to say, the other thing I would say to you is that it's quite natural that people look to the tax code is a way to achieve 
certain objectives. It's, it's, it's quite natural. Uh, th that runs counter to also some of the things we'd like to do to keep it yeah, simple. I understand that. And so, just given, given that, of course, my five minutes is about to expire, let me just rephrase the question again. Is there any way that this administration will embrace these renewable energy tax credits, extending them without requiring us to go out and borrow the money to do it? I don't think what we should be doing right now is looking to go out and uh, and ra raise taxes right now. So, so you think the uh, so the answer is in fact that the only renewable energy tax credits this administration will support, unlike your health insurance program where you pay for it, the only ones you'll support is if we borrow the money to well, provide I would those say tax in, credits. In health insurance, we're going to be paying for it, or I think. But you don't want to pay. You, with, with you it, comply with PAYGO on your health code, well, health insurance, but you refuse to do it here. Well, let, let me, me just, say, if I might, Mr. Chairman, ask him one other one other very important point because you have embraced the general approach in your legislation of what Secretary of Paulson has done in what I think was a remarkable conference about corporate tax changes. And you said in your background paper that you came and briefed our committee on that the resources in terms of revenue foregone spent providing narrowly targeted tax provisions could be used instead to provide sector-wide incentives for economic growth. It's unfortunate that this budget that you have to defend today totally forgot and rejected your approach. In fact, they not only rejected it and ignored it, they did just the opposite because they proposed to extend at least one of the tax credits permanently that you, were, you said you would rely on to lower corporate tax rates. You were in favor of responsible pay-go, pay-as-you-go, but this administration has rejected it, not only for energy tax incentives, but for anything else. The only kind of tax relief it will support is relief done on borrowed money, and I suppose there's no limit to how much money this administration is willing to borrow and get the nation in hock for. Hi. Thank you very much. Mr. Brady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I'm not so sure we should be jumping on this administration about the alternative minimum tax. I know serving here in 1999, a Republican Congress repealed uh, the alternative minimum tax. Unfortunately, uh, President Clinton vetoed that bill, saying it was tax relief for the wealthy. As we all know, it's, it's a real tax burden on more and more middle-class Americas. We would not be in this mess today uh, but for that veto. And I also don't think we ought to be jumping you about the war costs. If I recall, this new um, Congress came in. Do I need to yield to you, Chairman? If I recall, um, this new Congress came in to office promising to pay for the war, yet last year, I think we did $80 billion or more to support our troops and not a dime was paid for. And my guess is this year we'll do the same. So we ought to probably be looking in the mirror on both of those issues and dealing with it together, both parties in this Congress, rather than blaming you. Here's my question. What if I told you there was a sector of the American economy that's growing so fast that last year it represented the one quarter of all our growth? And this year, it continues to grow so quickly that it will be almost 40 percent of our economic growth here in America. This sector is growing across the country. It accounts for one of every three acres that we grow. It accounts for one of every manufacturing jobs we have in America, two out of every five technology jobs. What would you guess that sector of the economy is? Trade. It is. It is exports. And, Mr. Secretary, Given the growing consensus that it's not enough to just buy American, we have to sell American products and services all throughout the world, uh, and that when we have free trade agreements, our sales to those countries are twice as fast and twice as large as they are for countries we don't have agreements with. Given uh, the economy we have today and the fact that that is a sector that continues to create jobs an opportunity here in America. How important is it for Congress to pass this year the free trade agreements that are pending with Colombia, South Korea, which is a huge market, and Panama? Uh, very important. And I, I agree with the Chairman. We've, we've got more work to do on uh, to, to get Korea in shape uh, and 
but Colombia, we could we could get done right away. And of course, Korea is very very important in terms of the economic impact. Colombia is very important in terms of the economic impact and uh, and uh, the geopolitical uh, impact. So, again, it's been one of my frustrations, not just in Congress, but just looking at the perception that the American people have that we need to understand how important trade is to our economic well-being now and in the future. Well, we are not the only ones out there doing trade agreements. Uh, obviously, uh, our competitors are as well. We find that when U.S. companies go out to compete around the world, that almost uh, three times as, the, uh, as much of the world is tilted against us yeah. as our give us level playing field. So don't these free trade agreements not only create two-way trade to these countries, they give our U.S. companies in our states uh, an equal chance to sell our products, which is all we're asking to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've got it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank I yield back. Ms. Tub Jones from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good, good morning, good Mr. Morning. Secretary. How are you? I recall prior Secretary Snow coming before this committee having a discussion about the budget. And early on, nowhere in the budget was there any money included for the war. And I asked him why there was no money in the budget for the war, and his statement to me was that the president didn't want to go to war, and so therefore there was no money in the budget. Yet he couldn't explain the number of tankers that were out there in the ocean, the worker, the uh, veteran, uh, excuse me, the soldiers that were on the tankers, the cost of the military expenditures such as clothing, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me, um, how long have you been the secretary now, sir? About a year and a half. About a year and a half. And in that year and a half, uh, we've been doing supplementals on the war. Is that correct? It's correct. And then, so when you look at a budget, a supplemental is not included in the budget, so therefore there's no pay for for the cost of the war when it's not in the budget. Is that correct, sir? It's, uh, th th we, we've been, you're right, we've been using a supplemental, which again, I think is right there for everyone to see. The, the, well, that's not my question. I said there's no pay for required on a supplemental. Is that correct? I, I'm, I, in, in You're terms the secretary of, the way, of, excuse me? Is there a pay for required on a supplemental? In, in, terms of your, the, the, in terms of your roles and how you apply them, the, clearly everything is going to be, everything that's done is going to be ultimately paid for by the American people. Mr. Secretary, yeah. don't play words with me. Right. And a, with regard to a supplemental, there's no required pay for, is there, sir? Yeah, un, under your roles, you're correct. And so how much money is there not required to be paid for that's been expended on the war since you've been secretary? I, I don't have that number for you. Could you get it for me? Uh, I can get it for you, yes. Can you get it quickly so the American people know what that number is? I, I think the American people, again, the, 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 the number is in, in the budget. But it's we not it about, you're trying to play words with me about transparency. My question is, if it's supplemental, it's not in the budget, so therefore it's not required to be paid for. And there's a deficit operating out here on this war, correct? I, uh, yes or no, th sir? Th those are your words, madam. No, I'm asking the question. They should uh, be my words. What's so your answer? I, I will get you your answer. Thank you. Now, before you became the secretary, in fact, there was some amount of money that was spent on the war as a supplemental that was not included in the budget. Is that correct, sir? Uh, I, I, apparently. Yes or no, Mr. Secretary? I, I, I tell you, I'd say every, everything that's been spent on the war to date has been in the budget. And so it's been in the budget. It's, it's it, not been in the budget. It's been spent as a supplemental, not required for okay, a pay for. Is that been, correct? It's been spent as a supplemental. The, and so therefore it's not required to be paid for like in a, in a family budget where if well, you spend $10 and you have $10, it, it, it's accounted for. But under the way we do it, with the supplemental, it's not accounted for. Is that correct? Well, I, I would say this to me, whether it's a supplemental, whether it's in the budget, whether it's a pay for or not, it's, madam, it's all in the budget. 
and it's ultimately all it's paid It's not for. all in the budget, Mr. Secretary. It's, Would you run a business like you're running the government I, with a supplemental I, I, that's I, not paid I, I, I got to tell you, I would not run a business like I'm running the government or like you're running the House and Ways and Means or anything. I mean, the, the budget is a budget in business. You've got all kinds of rules and pay-fors, and, but I would say to you that— When the, you say you've got all kinds of rules, you mean the president has all kinds of rules and has the ability to have a supplement. I don't have that ability, well, do the, I, Mr. Secretary? The pay-for rules are congressional rules. Which makes sense, don't they? they? They should be paid for. What we spend should be paid for. Everything we do spend is paid for, madam. Uh, you know what, Mr. Secretary, let's go on to something else, because I don't want to play words with you. You actually recognize the problem we face as, as United States of America is the fact that the war is not paid for, and you continue to uh, have it offline, and that creates some of the dilemma we're facing right now. Yes? They're your words. Boy, oh boy, Mr. Secretary, I thought you'd be straight with me instead of playing games. But Rick, let me go on to something else seeing how I know the answer to those questions. Let's go to the housing problem that we're facing right now, Mr. Secretary. And in the budget, there are several things that you or the president has put forth with regard to the housing problem. They're really not going to fix the problem that generation after generation, you know, in minority families and working families, a house is usually the greatest asset we pass from one generation to the next. So, and in fact, the housing problem that we face right now is not only going to affect this generation, it's going to affect generations moving forward. Correct? Yeah, I tell you, housing is one of the most important assets that, that, that any family owns. So it's very, very important. So the problem is not only going to affect this generation, it's going to affect generations moving forward. Well, it will certainly have a long-term impact and as we go through this housing correction. <laughs> and we're very focused on this. This is a serious issue, and it's one— But it's, oh, your focus is only on a certain year with a certain group of families, not all of them, correct? Well, th we need to deal with this th this year and this group of families. We're dealing with the problems where we're finding it. And, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for not answering my question. Mr. Thompson of California is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for down here. Oh, sorry. Kind of hidden you. on the end. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, Secretary Paulson, how much money does the budget contain to fund the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? How much does the budget contain? We've got — there's obviously another $108 billion uh, the supplemental this year that hasn't been. No, no, not supplemental. In the budget. Oh, in the I budget. I understand there's seventy billion dollars. Se seventy billion, which is a seventy billion. Hold. Right. And does that mean that the president thinks that that's what it's going to cost seventy billion dollars to conclude uh, our operation in Iraq and to bring our troops I, home? I think everyone's been pretty clear that that isn't what he thinks it's going to include. That's a placeholder. And that number will be filled in later this year when we when we have a more precise estimate. So it's, of that it's a placeholder. Uh, tell me why it is that the the budget just came out and there's seventy billion dollars in it. Yet the Secretary of the Army is saying that we're going to need approximately hundred and seventy billion dollars uh, to uh, to uh, conduct our our operations yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, I, I read in the paper this morning that the Secretary of Defense, I thought uh, Bob Gates had put that out as a very rough estimate and said that it will become more precise as he had more information. Well, if, if everybody recognizes it's going to cost more than 70, even you say it's a placeholder, the uh, Secretary of Defense said his best guesstimate would be $170 billion. And with that kind of disparity, how is it that the American people can believe that there's any credibility in this budget at all, just on that point alone? That's your, that, that was a question or a statement? It's a question. How, how do you expect the American uh, people to believe that this is a credible document? As I said, this is a complex document. It's a document. I think it is just as credible to put out a number as a placeholder and say it's going to be above that, and as soon as we get well, the I, number, I that, we will fill it in. I, I guess that it even there's even less credibility when there's um, a statement by the administration that this budget is expected to be balanced, I think, by 2012 or something, whatever that date was, when there's not even a, an accurate number for uh, the war funding. And, and I find it 
I, I find it very troubling that the same document, this is a, this document is not just a fiscal document, but this is a, this is the priorities as for this country and the people in this country as seen by the President of the United States and his administration. And, and to add insult to injury on the, on the war funding issue, it, you're, you're asking in this document to come back to veterans, veterans who have sacrificed, veterans who have put their life on the line, veterans who have been injured in this war and asking them to pay more for the medical services that they're going to uh, receive. And, and I, I find that very, very troubling. And there's a substantial increase on the cost that veterans will pay for their medical benefits in your document. Let me ask also, um, shifting, shifting gears, uh, there's no mention of extending the renewable energy uh, incentives or the qualified tuition deduction in this uh, document. Does that mean that the President's position on extending these provisions uh, is that uh, he, he does not support that? He wants to see these taxes increase? It, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Some of, the, some of them are clearly extended and others we're quite prepared to talk about. And but it's not in the document. It's not in the document. You're so right. is extending these provisions built into your baseline? It is not built into the baseline. I, I couldn't hear you. It, it's, it, it is, if they're not extended, they're not built into the baseline. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, you, you also are a, a Medicare trustee, and I'd like to just quickly uh, get your comment on how the 45 percent number was, uh, was selected uh, in regard to the revenue limit for the trigger. Do, do you know? I, I don't know the history of that as to how it was selected, but it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly something we're focused on. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in, in, I just have a little bit of time left, but you've been very uh, helpful or you've shown a willingness to work with me regarding uh, some uh, American viticulture uh, issues uh, and it's really damaging to the U.S. wine industry and I appreciate your, your help, uh, but there's, uh, this, this thing's been dragging on forever. Uh, TTB has not, uh, uh, has not concluded their work. It's a major threat to the industry, not only in my district, but in wine-grown regions across the country. And I've had a lot of trouble getting answers to specific questions. And I have some questions here that I'd like to submit to you and ask you to answer me in writing and ask that you do it within the next couple of weeks because this has been dragging on and it's hurting a pretty important industry. Yeah. In yeah, you, you and I have talked about it several times. We'll keep working with you. And as you know, we're still getting comment, comments on these right. regulations. Okay. And appreciate how much you care about this. So, Mr. Chairman, could I submit this for the record and ask that uh, the Secretary respond in the next couple of weeks? Thank you. We have four votes on, and the Secretary has to leave at 12.30. Suppose we have the remaining members take two minutes and ask their questions and then see whether or not uh, the Secretary can give some broad response. And we'll start with Rahm Emanuel, Mr. Blumenauer, Mr. Kind. Mr. Pasquale, Ms. Berkeley, Ms. Crawley. Larson. Larson. No, no, Larson's on the list after okay. Pomeroy, Larson, and well, Van Allen. Mr. Char Mr. Chairman, although you called me first, when not you let Mr. Larson go first, and then I'll go after him? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your great cooperation uh, uh, with the chairman and our leadership with respect to uh, putting this uh, a very important uh, fiscal uh, package for relief that we needed uh, in a very timely and targeted fashion. Just a couple of uh, three quick questions for you. One of them has to deal with uh, what this uh, committee has taken up as it relates to alternative energy. And uh, yeah. I noticed that nowhere in the uh, Bush budget are there provisions for alternative energy tax credits. In light of, uh, my question is, first one is, in light of the uh, uh, incredible profits by Exxon Mobil and the fact that this committee last year suggested that we pay uh, for uh, these, uh, by end, uh, pay for the alternative energy tax credits by uh, ending tax subsidies for oil and gas, do you think that that's the right way to uh, proceed? And if so, why wasn't it included in the, the Bush budget? Second one has to deal with, uh, in getting the stimulus package out, uh, a number of, uh, I visited the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Clinic in Hartford in my district. 
Now, these clinics are crucial to the outreach program to make sure that the money gets into the hands of these hardworking people that, of course, will impact the stimulus. Yet the administration proposes cutting funding for taxpayer assistance centers. Uh, is this consistent with the uh, uh, IS, IRS's goal for earned income tax credit outreach? And what would you suge suggest here in terms of uh, uh, making sure that they uh, uh, get there? Uh, we uh, expedite this process so that we can, in fact, uh, provide the stimulus that we're seeking to do within the process. Yeah, I, I would say, if, let me start with the uh, last question first, because I do think that the, this has got to be a very high priority. I've uh, done a number of events, done one recently. I know many of you do events. The earned income tax credit is hugely important, and I, I think we're doing a better job, but there's still maybe up to a quarter of the people that, uh, that qualify for the earned income tax credit don't know about it, don't don't uh, get it, so th there's there's a big outre outreach effort that's necessary, and I will uh, pledge to you I'm going to just going to keep the IRS focused on that. That's that's very important. And in in terms of your question about the uh, about the different renewable energy tax credits and so on, again, I'd like to come back to something I tried to say earlier to Congressman Doggett that. There's a natural t a tendency to, to want to do everything, uh, not do everything, but do some things through the tax code. I understand that. That tends to make the tax code more complex. And I, 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 I think often we're better off just doing it through other measures other than the tax code. Uh, one of the disadvantages we have in doing these things through the tax code is the IRS and Treasury are not energy experts as opposed to DOE as we administer some of these things. So again, I would just, just, just make that general comment, although I think much has been done and will continue to be done through the tax code. This is not going to work, so let's cut it down to a minute and, okay. uh, and we can, uh, what you can't cover, you can send a response. And I'll so. get it. Mr. Emanuel. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, there's, I do have that I'll try to be really quick and run through this. Given that you refer to the wars, the $70 billion as a placeholder, Mr. Yeah. Secretary, somehow Secretary Gates, the Defense Secretary, knew it cost $170 billion, but somehow you and Chairman Nussel did not know it was $170 billion. And in all due respect, the budget was just out this week, and Secretary Gates testified at $170 billion. You're off by $100 billion because you're playing, either one concludes you're playing fast and loose with the numbers, A, or B, the right hand and the left hand are not talking around the cabinet table when you draft budgets. And I've been around the cabinet table drafting a budget. Somehow the defense secretary knows a number that neither you or the head of OMB know. And I would, I, I'm not asking you to answer it because it's not a pleasant answer. Second. You said that the 2001 and 2003 tax codes were unbelievably progressive. I would like to borrow your glasses, if I could. In 2001, 36 percent of the entire tax re revenue went to people earning over 200,000. In 2003, over 60 percent, close to 63 percent of the tax re revenues went to people over, over, earning over 200,000. There is no way by any estimation that could be called progressive. And then lastly, the tax, as the President of the State of the Union said, the budget has to show constraints. We, and you said don't use a tax code for su support on energy. We are supporting Exxon, Mobil, and other companies to the tune of $15 billion in tax subsidies, and yet not providing that to wind, solar, and power. We're tying ourselves in a tax code to the energy sources of the 20th century and strangling those that are going to be the energy sources of the 21st century. And I know enough about your record in the past and your commitment in environmental policy and energy policy that there is no way the Hank Paulson, who was head of chairman in Goldman Sachs, who is involved in NRDC and other entities, would believe that the tax code should be supplying an energy source of the 20th century and strangling those of the 21st century. I think that was done within a minute and 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Blumenau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, in my one minute, I'll just, I'll just frame something that I will forward to you in writing. Uh, one of the areas that I'm deeply concerned about uh, deals with the funding for infrastructure, the Highway Trust Fund. No, no. For the first time in history, it's going into deficit. 
Um, the administration proposes not to deal with it, not to work with this, to move it forward. Even the Chamber of Commerce agrees that we ought to raise the gas tax for the first time since 1993. Um, I, am, I am concerned that instead of borrowing from mass transit, which just shoves that into the red, that there ought to be some way to work together to figure out, uh, um, as you're leaving office, to help lay the foundation so we can deal with long-term infrastructure needs of the country. And with your permission, I'll just submit something in writing your direction. Good. And I'll also share that with Mary Peters. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, a couple of questions, and then you can respond. If you don't have time, please get back to us in writing. I'd appreciate that. Do deficits matter in your view? Uh, of course, I, you of course, of course they do. But I would like to finish the questions. I want to get these on the record. But would you answer the first one if you insist? Go ahead. Of course they do. Thank you. Now, what are the long-term consequences for our economy if we are to maintain deficits for the foreseeable future? Yeah, it's, it's, it's unsustainable. That's why we need to, to, to solve the entitlements. Third question is, what is the annual average income for people in the top 1 percent of the tax bracket? And the, the, the 2001 to 2003 tax cuts plus the AMT relief are permanently extended. If that happens, the top 1 percent of households would receive more than $1.1 trillion in tax benefits over the next decade. Why should Congress provide $1.1 trillion to the wealthiest 1 percent instead of using this $1.1 trillion to pay down the national debt? Chairman, could the uh, Secretary get back to us on the answers? No question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your testimony. Obviously, we'll be quick here. Uh, my understanding is if you look at the 10-year uh, costs of an extension of the President's tax cuts, you're talking about roughly $2.2 trillion over 10 years, and an extension of the AMT, if you did not provide AMT relief for that period of time, we're talking roughly uh, $800 uh, billion. Uh, if you could get back to me on whether or not, number one, those figures are uh, consistent with yours as well. I heard in response to Mr. English's uh, question that you said this kind of predictability is important, the kind of certainty for the taxpayer and the tax code. And the question is, doesn't that also apply to AMT taxpayers? And my question is this. Given that you are trying to hit a certain uh, a balanced budget within uh, a, a five-year period, why didn't you take some of the revenue that's lost for, for in, in, in extending the Bush tax cuts, just the portion that goes to the highest income earners and use some of that money in your budget to provide AMT relief for more middle-income Americans. Why didn't you make that choice? Would you like me to answer that now? I, the, yes. I, I, okay. Yeah. I think I want to thank you very much for staying here. And uh, it's just a question of time for the votes, and I think we got two minutes. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you. And so, may I just tee up an issue I have yet to speak? What is it? I have yet to speak. And in, in one minute, I'd just like to put an issue before the Secretary. Y yeah, if you, if you need it on no. the record, or do you want to stay here with the Secretary? Well, I'd love to stay, but I hate to miss the vote. So but I would just like to put a record, put an issue before okay, the Secretary. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm very concerned about, in this time of uh, economic challenge, we're going to have pension plans being canceled. Mark-to-market accounting on long-term liabilities is going to be extremely punishing relative to employers that want to keep their defined benefit pension plans in place. The plan assets will reflect the downturn in the market. The forward casting of uh, assets matched to liabilities will reflect lower interest rates. And so fully funded plans last year are going to look underfunded this year simply by a feature of this mark-to-market -market accounting. Uh, we need to enact smoothing legislation to ease the hit to employers on funding requirements. And I would just very much appreciate 
Treasury comment on that going forward. Thank you. Please, thank you. Adjourn and thank you. look forward to get responses uh, from Mr. Palmer. Question. We've got one minute, and I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.